understanding throughout the night. It is good for us to do it, to do it as it is written. And um, especially after the kind of spaghetti that we had tonight, we might be better off standing for a couple more minutes so that we are not overtaken by sleep. I mean, I've looked through scriptures. I have yet to see a man who falls asleep while standing. But we once saw a man in an evening meeting. Remember the man by the name of Eutychus. Paul was preaching, and you know Paul was known to preach long sermons. Is that familiar? Well, that's what the Bible says. Paul speaking, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus preached a sermon for three days. One sermon, and he went on for three days. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? So Paul was preaching a long sermon, and Eutychus, he fell asleep. And he fell down and died. But thank God he was raised from the dead. But the morale of the story is, imagine if Eutychus or Eutychus had been standing during that service. It was not likely that he would have fallen asleep until his death. So I want to encourage you, what we're doing right now is scriptural. And if you would tap into it, there is a blessing that comes upon the literal obedience to God's word. Amen. And so the other thing is, the Bible says, and Jesus stood up and he read. So we're going to stand and read tonight. Matthew chapter 7 verse 18. What does it say? The Bible says, a good tree cannot bear good fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Because it is good and pleasant when brethren dwell together in unity. Lord, our unity is not based on uniformity, but it is based on the power of your Holy Spirit and your love that binds us together. And so Lord, as we are here, Lord, may we remain in one accord in your presence, that we might enjoy the beauty of your holiness, that we might enjoy the beauty of sweet fellowship, even as we are together here with your Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus and let the entrance of your word tonight do what it does bring understanding to the simple let our hearts get illuminated let sins be forgiven let ailments be healed let burdens be broken and let yokes be shattered in here today in the mighty name of Jesus amen 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 let's be seated praise God God is good Alrighty, thank you so much guys. I appreciate you very greatly. Awesome. Alright. You know we've been reading this scripture for a while now. I'm sure you've noticed that every now and again the Lord will take us to this Matthew chapter 7. And we've been reading about good trees bearing good fruits and bad trees bearing what? Bad fruits. And um, if I let me show you this verse of scripture, we quite often just read it and gloss over it. And I think that's the reason why sometimes we unknowingly trivialize certain scriptures just because we no longer go back to read them. We just go from, from memory. It's good to go from memory when you're meditating, but every now and again, it's always good to go back and take a look at it. You see, Jesus was the word of God that became flesh. And yet he will still open the book to read. And so today we're going to read a verse of scripture from Genesis that we have become all too familiar with. And when we become too familiar with something that is powerful, we begin to miss out on the full potential of the thing. And there are married couples here that can relate with what I just said. You know, when you started dating one another, because you are yet to be as familiar with one another, just the thought of that person will make you feel like you are being baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, just thinking about them. And then just imagine then what happens when they walk into the room. I remember back then when I visited my wife in the girls' hostel where she was staying. I mean, she would pace around for like five minutes not even know, not knowing what to do, just out of excitement. She would offer me a drink, the same drink, like four times. Oh, would you like to have this? And I would say, but I just had one. And she was like, well, maybe you should have it again. You know, just that excitement. And now sometimes I walk into the house, I'm like, <clears throat> and she's still watching Atlanta live. 
and I'm like, <clears throat> and then she's scrolling on Facebook, and I'm like, hey, I'm here, and she's like, uh, who's here? And I'm just kidding, it's not that, you know, but I'm saying, what I'm saying is, before there is familiarity, we enjoy more the power of a thing or a person than we allow ourselves to after we have become familiar. You understand what I mean? But true story, I was still telling my wife yesterday. I said, I remember there was a time whenever you served me a drink, you would do a little curtsy. And she was like, that was in your fantasy. I never did. Which after a while, I kind of thought maybe that was just my fantasy. But that is what we do when something is yet to be familiar to us. We imagine it being more than it is. You understand what I mean? Remember when you were children, how you thought your dad was the strongest man in the world? Even though he couldn't change the light bulb, but no one could convince you otherwise. But as you got familiar with him and you see his humanity, then you begin to recognize that, man, this one too needs prayers after all. You see what I mean? I remember the, this, uh, anyway, let's not go there, but let's go to Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, and the reason why I said all of that is because I want us to forget about all of the things, maybe not all the things, but let's not be, um, let's not read this Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 the way we have always read it. Because what I want us to pay attention to today will do us a lot of good if we can lay hold of the potency of the messaging that is embedded in this verse of scripture. Now what does it say? It says, and I was even tempted to just recite it, but let's read it. The Bible says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. One of the things, Josephine, welcome back, good to see you. Did anybody miss Josephine while she was gone? Yeah, praise the Lord. Oh yeah, in fact, when, while you were gone, no one sat where you sit. There was one day I think Brother Matthew was almost going to sit there and he was just prompted by the Holy Ghost. He moved two seats over. I'm like, yeah, you better. Because there's a camera back there. You don't want to be caught in Josephine's seat. But good to see you and um, welcome back. I will welcome you again the moment I get my t-shirt that says with love from whatever you were. Yeah, with love from Liberia. Praise God. I've always said to us that whenever we see a conjunction or an article of speech, in the Bible, opening up a verse, we need to pay attention to whatever it might be doing there. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, now faith is. So if you're talking about now, what happened just before? This one is saying, then God said. What happened? Why was our attention being drawn to what was about to be said using that particular article or conjunction if you would that says then let's read verse 25 just for a little context the bible says and god made the beast of the earth according to its kind cattle according to its kind and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind and god saw that it was good so God was like, wait a minute. When you make something according to its kind, it's a good thing. So he made the trees. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, Manuel Lida is in class. Yeah, she came to school today. That is excellent. You see, when, you, when God made the tree, he embedded within the tree the seed and the ability to be able to produce after its kind. And he also made even the creeping things I mean, God said it was good, but I'm not sure I agree all the time because I'm like, why was the serpent or the snake given the ability to produce after its kind? We can do without those things. Uh, well, and then until you have an infestation of rats and then you're like, oh, maybe not. You know, but in reality, everything, even the creeping things that creep upon the face of the earth have the ability to produce after their kind. And God says, this is a good thing. And that was the reason why the Bible says, then God said. 
So basically, because of what he had seen, because of what he had begun, he had started the process of reproduction, having a thing or a being be imbued with the ability to reproduce after its kind. And God was like, these people haven't seen anything yet. Because if I have just made the cattle to reproduce after its kind, wait until I reproduce after my own kind. <laughs> and so that was the reason why God says, now let us make man in our image. Because if all of these things are being seen as good and beautiful, because they are able to produce, how much more the creator himself. Many years ago, we were at uh, a leadership class, and the man of God who was leading the class said to us, he, he asked us, he says, what is the role of an evangelist in the body? You know, the Bible says that the Lord has given give these gifts unto men, some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers, and then others evangelists. And so we who knew the scripture were so excited when he asked the question, because I'm like, this is a cheap point. So I raised what was left of my finger that I'd been biting since the beginning of the class. And I said, I know, and he called me, and I said, the role of the evangelist is to bring lost souls into the body, to go and evangelize, to let people know how good God is so that they can come and have a taste. And then it was like, okay, that's your answer. What about you? What's the role of a pastor? He asked another person. And the other person was like, oh, just like this one said, the evangelist brings them and then the pastor nurtures them and teaches them because the Bible never separated the role of a pastor from that of a teacher. People did that so they can sell more t-shirts. You see what I mean? They talk about the fivefold ministry for the fourfold gospel. I've always felt like there was a mismatch, but in reality, it's fourfold. Apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then you have the prophets. Because how can you pastor when you don't teach? Jesus was the one that elaborated on and in fact instituted the ministry of pastors because he called Peter to be a pastor. The same one who called Paul to be an apostle. When he called Peter originally, what was Peter's calling? Peter was called to be a pastor. He said to him, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you. He says, feed my lamb. Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. And then he asked him again, Peter, do you love me? And that was when the Bible says, he said with utmost zest that, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, tend my sheep. Now, who tends to the sheep? The pastor. But a pastor cannot just be tending to the sheep without feeding the sheep. Imagine if I give you a little lamb. If your name is Mary, and we give you a little lamb, and, and you don't feed. You see, I'm walking my way back into my wife's good books after my very horrible jokes at the beginning. So I have to use her name. You see, if you had a little lamb and you never fed it and all you did was you kept tending it, making sure that it didn't get in the ditch, making sure that its fur didn't get overgrown, after a while, you will have nothing. And so pastors and teachers, I, I, I like to take my time to explain that because a lot, of the, a lot of the chaos that we see in the body of Christ today is because people find the glamour of the office of a pastor just enough and they do not do the teaching. Dead people don't ask questions. And many people prefer to pastor those who cannot put a... Um, what's the word? It's not a burden but they can put a demand on the men of God to speak the mind of God. If you were pastoring people, you just needed to make them feel good. Make sure that the music is good, that the air condition is right, it's not too cold for Barbara, not too hot for Alan, and then once you can do that, you see that's why they sit in different wings of the building, I think this is colder than that, or warmer. Once you can do that, people are happy, you're tending them. But you need to, in addition to that, feed. Does that make sense? And so when this man of God asked us what the role of an evangelist was, that of a pastor, that of a prophet, we were spewing things out like robots, like, oh, we were sounding all of us like Alexa. You ask us, we give it to you. Ask us, you give it to you. But in reality, by the time we were all done, he said that none of us was right. I started to rebuke the spirit of the false prophet at that particular point in time because I was so sure that I was right. What are you telling me? 
He said to us very simply, he says the role, the primary function of an evangelist in the body of Christ is to produce other evangelists. Because when Jesus sent them to go, he didn't say to them to just go and preach the gospel. He says, go and make disciples of men. And what are you making disciples of men in? In the art of baptism. Baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. To be baptized means to be immersed. It's not just to dunk them in water and let them go out again. Be Sometimes they're worse than they were when we threw them in the water. Because if that is all we're doing, we are just performing religious liturgies that leave people emptier than when they came. We only truly baptize people when we allow them to be immersed in the love of the Father, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then fully immersed even further in the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But he said to them, first of all, you make disciples. You produce after your own kind. It is very critical for God to see reproduction, to see that continuity, to see fruitfulness. Jesus says that a tree that does not bear fruits will be cast away by my Father. It's going to be uprooted and cast away. Now, if you know anything about God, the reason why God casts things away is because they have become alien to him. The Bible says in him all things consist and he is the father of what? Of the living, the God of the living and not the God of the dead. And so you can't be dead and remain in God. And so if God himself is a fruitful God who has borne fruits in you and I, then the moment you choose to be unfruitful, guess what? You can no longer remain in him because what connection has light to do with darkness? And the angel of the Lord asked the women, why seek ye the living among the dead? If you do not have heaven's authority to seek the living among the dead, then you cannot go and seek the dead among the living. Jesus said it, let the dead bury the dead. And so you have to be fruitful because your heavenly father is fruitful. And how has God demonstrated his own fruitfulness? He demonstrated his own fruitfulness by making man in his image and in his likeness. Because every time there was mention of a being, a creature, or some tree producing after its kind, heaven cheers and says, oh, this is good. And so when God produced us at the beginning, we were good until we partook of the seed that made us corrupt. Um, it's interesting because it's not really the, the tree or the fruit that made them corrupt. It was the disobedience to what God said. Because you know what happened to Adam and Eve was the ultimate goal of God was that they would be like him. You know, when God started out, he wasn't, he wasn't mincing words. He said what he wanted to do. He says, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. God, is, God said, I want man to be like me. But the process was not yet complete when Satan came. And Satan was like, you don't have to wait to graduate. Just graduate now. Eat of the fruit and be like God now. What Adam and Eve did not know was that if they had thought about what God said, which is interesting because even myself, it wasn't until I was meditating on it lately that it occurred to me that God did not give them a sentence out of anger. He only told them the process that he created. He said, in the day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil, that same day you shall die. Why? Because when God made man, God expected man to be a process on the earth. A process of learning, line upon line, precept upon precept, until he has acquired all the knowledge and God will erase everything and put him in eternity. So what awaited him at the end of the day was an exit strategy called death. So if you jump the gun by eating of the, all the knowledge in one day, then you die because that's the end of it. <laughs> you see, the Bible says whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is. Have you ever asked your question that he is what? It is the same way that he said to Moses, I am that I am. If you are sick, I can be the healer. If you're tired, I can be your strength. 
If you are loveless, I can be the lover of your soul. You see, the way God's name is, is that it is beautiful for every situation. So whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is kind, that he is love, that he knows what he's doing, that he is aware. And the reason why many of us question God is because we don't even believe that he is all-knowing. And that's why you're like, why did you put the tree there? Even you, God, why did you put the tree there? You could have just let them be without the tree. That would have made him <laughs> an unfair God. <laughs> What's funny? <laughs> I don't know. But in reality, I think like that. I don't know about you. Yeah. And I'm sure Josephine does too. Because while all of y'all were chuckling, she was like agreeing with me very seriously. But God does things like that so that he will not contradict himself. When he made man in his image and in his likeness, he allowed for man to be able to choose to do things because God also chooses to do things. God says, upon whomever, I will be merciful. I will be merciful. You can't force me to be merciful. It's only if I want to. You see what I mean? And so God would only truly be God if he gives you the ability to choose and then he gives you choices. What is the point of saying choose from the following and I give you only one answer? I mean, I would like that because that would be the answer. But God gives us options. But the reason why they died was because they jumped to the end. But guess what? God was like, whether you start from the end or you start from the beginning, you will still complete my course. It cost me a lot to produce this school. The earth is a school. Solomon said it. He says, God placed man under the sun that he may be exercised and understand the reason of things and how they add up. And that's where we get the expression in the Greek language, mathematics, because the expression there in Ecclesiastes of how things add up is the word mathematics. And so God set man up in a school, a school so beautiful. It had no walls. Have you seen our schools lately? They're not different from our jails. Those fresh minds are boxed in four walls and you expect them not to be restless. Oh my goodness, I'll be restless all day if anyone puts me in that school. But that's not license for y'all to be restless. You need to behave yourselves in case, you're, in case you're hearing me back there. You understand what I mean? But God put man in a garden so that he can learn. God did not want to label man with all the knowledge in one day because he can't handle it. But Satan came and sold man on the idea and then man, what? He died. But where I'm going with that ultimately is this. When God started us out, he started us out to be like him, but we can only be like him in his own way. So if you are not producing as God produces, he will spill you out. On the call on Monday, I was able to share with the man, and if you have men in your life that do not join our Monday prayer meeting, yeah, you're missing out. And so are they. You know why? Because we promote the Monday meeting. Maybe we can do better at promoting it, actually, to truth be, th truth be told. But we run that meeting not because anybody gives us money. Sometimes more than half the people who come to that meeting don't even attend services here. So it's not because we want to be able to sell them books or T-shirts or take an offering. No, but we do that because if things are right with men, things will be right in homes. And, and when, once things are right in homes, all shall be well in the world. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So we invest in men. And one of the things that the Lord gave me to share with them on Monday was the scripture in Revelations where God was telling John through the ministry of the angels of the church or one of the angels of the church that look, I know your works. You have become lukewarm. It is either your heart or your cold. If you are neither of the two, I will spill you out of my mouth. And you know, for me, I, I had read that scripture several times. We used that scripture, or the scripture was used on us when we were children at school. I mean, I mean when we were children at church, when, when we're not serving as we should. They tell us that we're being cold. And when you're serving too much, they say you're too hot. You see what I mean? But what they don't want is for them not even know where you're at. You understand what I mean? We need to know where you're at, because if you're just in the middle and you're lukewarm, we're going to spill you out. And we ran with very similar understanding and some of you have variations of that. But when I sought the Lord concerning that verse of scripture, wanting to know exactly what it truly means, what did the Lord say to me? 
He took me to the mountain and he took me to the temple. And when I saw the temple and I saw the mountain, that was when I knew what it meant to either be hot or cold. You see, God wants you to be one of the two. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm. Why? Because the moment you become lukewarm, you are no longer like God. None of the things that describe the attributes of God in the Bible is lukewarm. What does it mean to be hot? The people that were hot seeking God were the ones who attended to the fire of the tabernacle. In the tabernacle of meeting, fire was required to burn all day as an indication of the presence of God. Look at all the prophets that saw the presence of God. What is one thing that is common to what they saw? Fire. There was always fire in the presence of God. When God spoke to Samuel, where did the, where did the voice of God come from? He came from around the fire because that was where he was. It was his duty that night to tend to the fire. And so when you're tending to the fire of God's presence, then you are hot. It doesn't matter if it's winter outside, you are sitting right next to that fire and it is not a little fire. It was the desire of the priest to ensure that the fire was so high in the tabernacle of meeting that they can see the smoke rise till their eyes could see no more into the clouds. So it wasn't some little fire. It wasn't like what, you know, religious people do today. They just light one little candle and, and they expect the presence of God to come. You will get a spirit the size of a candle. God help you if you don't get a terrible demon. If you're going to do it, do it right. These people will light real fire. So the people who were attending to the presence of God in their service to other people were hot. And then the ones who would leave everything behind to seek the Lord in consecration, where did they go? To the market? No. To their friend's house? No. They went to the mountain. Anywhere you go in the world, it doesn't matter if it is Stone Mountain or the Himalayas. It is always cold on the mountain. Oh yeah, I'm from Nigeria. It's hot all year round until you go to the mountain. <laughs> you can go to the mountain in the hottest regions in the world. You will need a jacket. When you see people who live on the mountain, it doesn't matter where they're at. They all look the same. Yeah, they all have lots of gray hair and they all bundle up. And they all talk very fast because of the cold. Their mouths are always chattering. Yeah, well, in fact, some of you don't know that there is a promise to the New Testament believer in the book of Isaiah that talks about the ones who will speak with stammering lips and how they will become a mystery to their generation. It is important for us all to speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, if you don't speak with the stammering lips, the enemy can figure you out too easily and so can other people. Those who are on the mountain, they speak with stammering lips. And that's why God is like, it's either you're by the fire or you're on the mountain. I need you in one of those two phases at all times. The moment you leave consecration, I want you to be in service. Not in church service, but in service to other people. By attending to the presence of God wherever you go. But God is like, we have looked on the mountain, we didn't see you. We came to the tabernacle of meeting by the fire. You were nowhere to be found. God says, I will spew you out of my mouth. What happened to Eli? Eli was neither by the fire, neither was he on the mountain. And God spewed him and his children out of his mouth. When Samuel was not by the fire, where did Saul find him? When Saul was looking for the seer, himself and the servant of his father, they went to the regions where he was. And they were like, we're looking for the man of God, the seer. And they said, you would have to go on the mountain to find him. But many of us, we have become so complacent. You are not seeking God and you are not serving people. And you are just there. You, yourself, and Netflix. God made man in his image and after his likeness. And for you to remain in God, you have to remain homogeneous with God. The homogeneity, do people even still use that word? You have to remain one with him. Let's just simplify it. To, to be homogeneous means to be one of the same kind and of the same material. The same composition, constituent of the same structure. Because if we are not one with God, then there's no way. God is not going to become a freak because you choose not to be in compliance. It is you that would have to go. He never changes. But as much as this message so far has sounded like a beating, to be honest, I thought it was going to be a joyful one because of the insight that God gave to me concerning what it means to be made in the image and in the likeness of God. Do you believe that God is a good God? 
when he made everything, the process of making a thing to produce after its kind, is it a good thing? Yeah. It's there in the word of God that it is a good thing. God himself said it. He says, wow, this is good. Right? And so if God is a good God who makes good things, demonstrated also by Jesus, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good, healing all manners of sicknesses. Jesus did good. You are supposed to do good. But the problem right now is you are struggling to do good. Romans chapter 7, Paul said, the good that I will to do, I do not. He said, but you see that evil that I will not to do is what I practice. He said, I have sought the Lord these three occasions in prayer and in fasting and earnest intercession that the Lord would take this thing away from me. He said, but it has remained a thorn in my flesh, this messenger of Satan. What is that messenger of Satan? The inability within the human being inherently in his flesh to do good. He said it in Romans chapter 7. He said, "O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The Bible says Jesus speaking of himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But your flesh is always gravitating towards death because the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. The flesh is always seeking to be in sin. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so that was why he concluded that he was living in the body of death. He says, the good that I will to do, I do not. And that is the trouble with many of us today is that we find within us another law that is operating contrary to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But the one who made me in his image and in his likeness is good. So can a good God produce a bad fruit? What is going on? The Holy Spirit woke me up today. And he told me that it was time to deny the lie so that you can embrace the truth. Many of us were trying to embrace the truth, but we haven't denied the lie. And so the lie is getting between you and the truth. It's like trying to hug your wife and your neighbor is standing between the two of you. It's not going to be a good hug. You understand what I mean? Because you're not able to experience each other in fellowship because there is a dielectric between you and insulation that stops the flow of your affection one for another because you are not making contact. The reason why many of us do not experience the love of God is because there is always another that is present with you when you are trying to engage God. And God says you need to put out the evil one. You need to uproot the tree that is bearing bad fruits if you want to enjoy the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. You want to enjoy the tangible voice of God in your ear. You need to put out the noise. You want to be reminded all the time that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You need to put out the filth of guilt that comes to haunt you all the time. And this is what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 7. If I let's finish reading Genesis 1 26, because we're going to take two or three more things from there. The Bible says that let him have dominion over the birds, over the fish of the sea. Okay, let me start reading 26 again. The Bible says, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion, not over one another. A man is not supposed to dominate another man, dominate another man, no. Human beings are not meant to dominate one another. They are supposed to unite so that they can collectively dominate. But the moment we are divided, we will be dominated. You may want to call your Democrat friends if you're a Republican and make peace. And if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you may want to call your Republican friends because this system has been taken advantage of by the sons of Satan, by the Luciferians, to make us divided so that they can dominate us rather than us dominating the beast of the field and the creeping things that creep upon the face of the earth. We should not allow anything divide us. I may check a different candidate on the ballot box, but I always choose you in my heart. The Bible says preferring one another before self. But you know the enemy will make it justifiable for you to deny the truth so that you can embrace a lie. What is the sole mission of Hollywood? Hollywood's sole mission is very simple. 
to present the truth to us as fiction and then give us fiction as the truth. A lot of what they tell us is fiction is the truth. A lot of what they tell us is the truth is fiction. When you read the Bible, then you know. You know, they keep telling you that the sun is like millions and millions of miles away and it is a burning gas that is millions and millions of times the size of the earth. And I'm like, but wait a minute, why did the one who made them in the day that he made them put them together in the firmament of the heavens? It's either you are lying or the word of God is not true. But ladies and gentlemen, Romans chapter 3 verse 4 is all the help you need. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Here we are folks, we're supposed to have dominion. He says, let them. Thank God the Bible did not say, let him have dominion. Otherwise, the man would have said, well, you heard it, woman. Kneel down there until I repent from my anger. The Bible says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the, what? the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. What do you get out of that? When God made every one of these things that he's telling us to have dominion over, he said that those things are good because they can produce after their own kind. So for you to have dominion over them means God has an expectation of you to even be more like him than your dog's little puppy looks like your dog. <laughs> there is an expectation here. There is a hierarchy here that God expects for us to comply with if we will function in that divine order. Now let's go back to the softer side of the message. Maybe. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 18. He says, A good tree cannot bear a bad fruit. Is God fruitful? God is fruitful because God is good. Now, someone is saying, But God is not a tree. Well, Jesus said, God is a tree, and I'm going with that. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. God calls man. The Bible says that we are like green olive trees in the house of the Lord. So if God sees us as trees, then himself sees himself as the parent tree that has produced after its kind. And so if God is saying, I cannot bear good, I cannot bear bad fruits because I am a good God and I am good because I produce, Jesus would not have cursed the tree that did not produce if God does not produce. That would be injustice. That would be unfair. And we know that God has produced. He gave us his only begotten son. He says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And he also said, for as many as have received you, even to those who believe on your name, have I, God, given the power to become sons too. And so God is in the business of producing all the time. The Bible says that God added to the church daily. Many as were saved. God believes in multiplication. And so if you know that God is committed to producing and he's a good God who can only bear good fruits, then God is bearing good fruits in your life. You're probably just the only one who cannot see it. Because the devil keeps pointing to you the bad fruits that you produce. Paul said it best in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. He says there is therefore now. After he lamented. You know that you need to go and study that perhaps on your own. I encourage it. Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. You can see the agony of the man of God. As he struggled with the animal nature. And the God nature. When man partook of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. He had to go back to the base most level of human existence. And which is to become an animal. When God made man in his image and in, this, and in his likeness, he did not need to have clothing because the Bible says that the glory of the Lord was his covering. And when he fell, he noticed that he was naked. He was worse than the animal. Have you ever seen a naked animal? Think about it. I know some people in California like to skin their cats so, so they can scare their neighbors. That is their own doing, not God's doing. Animals have natural clothing. So when man fell and he was exposed, that means he became even less than an animal. If you don't think about it that way, you will never truly appreciate what Jesus did for us. 
because by the sacrifice that he made, we are once again robed in righteousness and allowed to sit next to God. Which is also the reason why the devil is so mad because the devil is like, man, these guys are where I've always wanted to be. Because Satan never wanted his throne to be above God. He says, no, he says, I want my throne next to the Almighty. So he never wanted anything more than you are and you think he's going to let you be? No, he's always hunting. He's always looking to pull you down because Satan is of this mindset. If we're not, if I'm not going to be there, then you're not going to be there. I'm going down and you're coming with me. That's his whole mantra. The reason why he's deceiving people is because he doesn't want to go to hell alone. He doesn't want to be banished alone. He probably invented the phrase, the more, the merrier. So that's why you can't let him take you with him. Jesus already took you with him. Stay there. Paul said, who would deliver me from this body of death? He says, but I thank God that even though I obey the laws of sin in my members, with my heart, I obey the laws of God according to the inward man. And then afterwards, he said in chapter eight, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set them free from the law of sin and death. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to know who your father is. You need to know how good God is. Because the moment you recognize that he is good, then you know that being a tree himself, he must be producing for him to be good. And what has he produced? He has produced me. Because when Jesus fell to the ground and died, he likened himself to a seed. He said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when he fell to the ground and died, he raised up trees, these olive trees that are in the house of the Lord, that they may surround the tree of life. And so if that is who you are, then there is no reason why you should not be living up to your God-given potentials. There's no reason why you should not call on the name of God all the time. Do you know that from years of counseling, one of the things that I have found counseling and pastoring, one of the things that I have found that keep people from praying to God is because they do not even believe that God will listen to them. The devil convinces them that they're not worthy of God's attention, so they wallow some more in their own guilt. The reason why some people find it difficult to forgive is because they feel so human. And when you feel human, what do you feel? You feel hurt. You feel the pain. That person's hurt me too much to forgive them. But if you remember that your father is a good God who bears good fruits and you're one of his fruits and there is nothing that he does not forgive, then guess what? You also begin to forgive people freely because of the nature of God that is on the inside of you. Think about whatever it is, that problem that the believer has that is keeping them away from being as Christ upon the earth and it boils down to not looking at themselves in the light of God's goodness as a good fruit that has come out of a good tree. There is no benefit you get from carrying guilt. There is no benefit you get from being evil. So why do you want to be guilty and evil? When you can be good and when you can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, every moment that you spend embracing the nature of sin that is on the inside of you, you are doing what? You are feeding that bad tree and that bad tree will produce bad fruits. So what do you do? You immediately curse the bad tree. You immediately put out the evil flame. You immediately put out any conscience or consciousness within you that is speaking of evil. I'm going to give you three practical applications of what I have just shared and we're going to break bread. Application number one, I've sort of touched on it, is this. You need to remain in the Lord Jesus Christ always. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. What does it mean to abide? To abide means to be inside of another. 
So to be inside of the good God and to remain there is not to allow your arm to be sticking out. So if your arm is short toward your neighbor and you're not generous, guess what you are doing? Your hand is no longer in alignment with the hand of God because the Bible says that God gives generously without reproach. So if every time you bless somebody, you want to tell other people, oh, that have you seen Caroline's new dress? I bought it. It's nothing really. I just wanted to be a blessing. When the word of God says, do not let your right hand know what your left hand has just given. Jesus says, do not be like the Pharisees who wear long robes when they're about to pray and they go in the town center and then they lift up their beard and say, oh God of Abraham, you know that I am here to pray to you. Jesus says, immediately they have their reward. Their reward is the commendation of men. Now, you're sitting here. What has the commendation of people ever done for you? Unless you're an Instagram influencer and all those likes, Instagram gives you money for it. But in reality, people's commendation, apart from stroking your ego, what does it do for you? And Jesus says they have their reward. Those people who give and announce on top of the hill that they have just given, and that is not what God does. Imagine if God was, were to spend time like you all day talking about what he's done for you. Someone else would have to be God because he would be too busy describing how he lovingly saves you from your own thoughts. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But still the mercy of God prevails because if God lets everything that you think about happen, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> If you know, you know. <laughs> but God doesn't. He doesn't. Because the Bible says, without the mercy of God, every one of us would have been consumed. Even the ones who are seeking after God. Say that one more time. Oh, yeah, thank God for mercy. David was like, I am Jacob. Of the generation of those who seek the Lord, I shall not be consumed. Why? Because it is by the mercy of God. So what do we do? We keep ourselves in him. We abide in him and when you abide in him means you do not do the things that he doesn't do god does not hold anybody in unforgiveness the bible says jesus would not speak a thing unless he has heard of his father so to abide in jesus is to speak like he speaks he speaks only the mind of god and so if you have no good thing to say about the situation please keep your mouth quiet because the power of life and death are in your tongue and god has put you here the bible says you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So if you cannot shine light on the situation, just let it be the way it is. Until the light comes. When God came and there was no light, he did not bring more darkness. No, he said, let there be light. You understand what I mean? So if you abide in him, what are you going to do? You will bear much fruit. So that is the first thing. The first thing is judge your actions relative to what the good tree that you already know is. Jesus says no one is good but my heavenly father. And so don't try to be like me. Don't try to be like anybody else. Be like him. Because you can only be like me if you are fully led of the Holy Spirit because it takes the Holy Spirit to understand people like me. According to Manuel Leader. Right? But in reality, according to the word of God, it takes the Holy Spirit to know another person enough to say that, yes, I can judge you or I can be like you fully. No, why? Because of the fact that each and every one of us, the Bible says that we are a mystery. And so what do you do? Let the Lord himself be your standard. Jesus said that because somebody else was calling Jesus good and Jesus was like, if I accept this guy's commendation, other people may follow after that example and it's not going to end well for them. So what do I do? I point to God. If my life is not pointing you to God, don't follow me. If you see an area of my life where my life is not pointing you to God, say, well, I love you, but in that area, I would have to disciple you. You will not disciple me because I don't see the glory of God. I'm not talking about people judging. I'm talking about people who actually truly know how to inspect the fruits of the Spirit. For Jesus says, by their fruit we shall know them. You can only assess me if you understand what fruition mean. And if you're not bearing the fruits of the Spirit yourself, then how do you even know whether I have the fruit or not? You don't even know what it is. It's like if I send you to Kroger and I say, can you go and buy me a Ressonyon? You will never find it because you don't even know what Ressonyon is. It doesn't exist, I just made it up. Oh yeah. 
But that is the reality of it. You have to know what you're looking for. The second practical application that I want us to take up out of this good fruit or good trees bearing good fruits is the Bible says that it is impossible for a bad tree to bear good fruits. So it is not possible for your bad habits to bear good fruits. You know some people's bad habit, you know what it is? Let me use the one that is most common, unforgiveness. You think that by not forgiving somebody, you will teach them a lesson? Do you know we say things like that? We say things like, I'm gonna show this girl how this thing works. Really? You cannot use darkness to show me a thing. Because in the dark, what do people do? They stumble. Jesus says there are 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. Those who walk in the day will not stumble. Why? Because there is light. So I cannot say that I will not talk to my wife for a whole day so that she knows I am unhappy with her. I tried it before. <laughs> we got my wife a new car. This particular van, it was a Honda van many years ago. And I think two or three days after we got the van, she went somewhere and she knocked down someone's mailbox. But she says she didn't knock it down that she kind of just brushed it. But you need that to send the car. And so when she came, I saw it. She didn't even call me, she didn't tell me. I saw the thing on the car. I was like, hey, 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 young woman, what is going on here? And she looked at it and she was like, oh, I may have hit someone's mailbox. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but this is serious. You need to be sorry. And she refused to be sorry. So I didn't talk to her the rest of the day. Guess who was sorry at the end of the day? I was. I was hungry, I was confused. <laughs> because if you know me, I'm always looking for Rosemary. Where's my wife, where's my wife? I couldn't even choose who to call first, my mom or my sister, because she usually never like, who do you think I should call first? So I was both hungry and confused. At the end of the day, my bad tree did not produce the good fruit that I thought. I thought that at the end of the day, if I was mad and I didn't talk to her, she would come and apologize. Eventually, I was the one who said, you know what? I went to look at the car again. It's not even that serious. <laughs> yeah. It was just a little scratch. Are you sure you even hit anything at all? <laughs> Maybe I just need to clean my glasses some more. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. A good tree. You see, this was Jesus speaking. He said a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So if I am doing things that are not of God, I can never expect anything good to come out of it. You're very stingy, and you think by saving all of what you get, you would ever build an empire. No, the Bible says there is he that withholds more than he needs and ends up in poverty. Whereas the liberal soul shall be made fat. There is he that scatters, the Bible says, and yet increases. You can't spend your time serving other people. They want to move, and the moment you know they want to move, you block their number, so they don't call you to come and pick up boxes. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember when we were moving from Swanee to Sugar Hill, we didn't tell anybody what we intended to do. And what we intended to do was give up, give away everything that was in that old house. And most of the things in that old house were maybe three years old, because when we moved in, we had nothing. We just came here from the UK. We had absolutely nothing but our own selves. So we bought everything new. And when we were moving, about three years later, we, less than three years, was like two and a half years, we decided, my wife and I, that we would give away everything that was in the house. So we told people that we were moving and asked if they wanted to come. Only one lady showed up. And when she showed up, she was looking at the dining table. If I had that dining table, we didn't even buy it. I built it, which is even better than buying it because I built it with love. It was a really good table, if I may say so myself. Yeah, you remember that table? If you had come to help us move, maybe it would have been yours. No, no, because I had to say that because I said there was only one lady and I didn't want you to think that it was her. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, you know, you know how that works. But in any case, this lady came and she was looking at that table. And my wife was like, oh, you like it? She was like, no, I love it. And she was like, you can have it. She was like, what do you mean I can have it? My wife was like, the table and the benches that come with it. You see, but let me tell you something. What if she had been like the other people 
who did not unblock our numbers until we moved into the new house. So sometimes when you think you are hurting other people, you are hurting yourself. The Bible says do not withhold any good from your brother while it is called today. While it is called today, do not withhold any good. Because whatsoever you give, Jesus says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. The reason why we have become stingy in the church is because the only scriptures or the only time we hear scriptures on generosity is when pastors want to take the offering. We teach people to be generous with mammon, but we teach them to be callous with grace. And that is the reason why we have become upside down believers walking like buffoons. The reality of it is this, we need to learn how to be generous with the true riches of the kingdom. Your time, your heart, your compassion, your patience. Because the only way for things to multiply is for what? Is for you to give. You are a tree. Your heavenly father is a tree. Have you ever seen a tree grow by holding on to all its leaves? No. Trees grow by shedding. They disperse. When a tree is about to multiply, it prays for the wind to come to disperse its seed all over the place because if the pollen is not blown around, nothing happens. And you cannot self-pollinate. You must be some real freak out of the jungle to be able to do that. Anyway, I'm trying not to open the Bible so we can wrap it up. So I've given you two practical applications. If I let us rest on that note, I would have loved to give you a third, but you can find the third on your own. Um, okay, maybe I'll just give it since I already said. <laughs> one practical application of being a tree is in Psalms chapter one. The Bible says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like what? A tree that is planted by the rivers of living waters, bearing its fruits in its season, and its leaves also shall not wither. But the Bible says the ungodly, they are not so. Because they're not like that tree that is planted. The moment you catch the revelation that your heavenly father is a tree, do you know one of the most prominent things around the throne of God to let you know that God sees himself as a tree? is the river of life. Even God himself has water all around him. And that is how God expects you to be surrounded by water. People that water you. Actions that water you. Pledges, pledge yourself to be in an environment wherein you are watered. Feed yourself with the word of God. Take root in the things of the kingdom. Because if you are not rooted, when the storm comes, it will blow you away. If the only scripture you know is the one I quote on Tuesdays and on Saturdays, that is not enough root. You're a tree for crying out loud, not a potted plant. Potted plants just need a little sprinkle of water every now and again. And that is the reason why even the wind does not need to come. You just need to have a toddler that is active enough. They will knock them over the shelf. And the end of them will be in the trash. But if you know that you're a tree, you have to keep taking roots so that you can bear good fruits. Because it is your father's expectation of you. If you and I are not producing after our own kind, God says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Because I'm not going to end my legacy in you. I want you to be a con continuity of my legacy God takes it very seriously all of what he has poured into you he expects you to pour it into other people so that there is no stagnation every river that we've seen described in heaven flows when God made the garden of Eden there were three there was a river that came from the presence of God out of Eden to water the whole region of the garden and it became four river heads and every one of them was a flowing river if you look at the meaning of those names it talks about rivers that originate from God with the intention for life to bring what to bring fruitfulness wherever it goes that is the meaning if you look at the meaning of those names from Avila to, to Heideko to Tigris, to Euphrates. That is the meaning of those rivers. The end of them is what? The end of them is fruitfulness. And there's no fruitfulness if there's no flow. It shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Do you know what, Bible, what the Bible calls living water? Have I ever shared that with you here? A living water is a moving water. When water does not move, it's dead. So it has to be what? It has to be moving. Jesus demonstrated that with the man who was standing by the pool of water and he was sick for 38 years. 
Because whenever the water has life, it was not able to get into it. When the angel of the Lord came and he moved the water, the water became alive. Whoever came into that water will receive their healing. And so the word of God has to keep moving through you. It's not just for you to learn one scripture and just put it on the shelf of your mind. No, the word of God has to keep moving through you. How does the word of God move through you, Kenyatta? By you meditating on it. Meditation is a, peer, is a process of churning or turning or moving the water of the word of God that it might do you good everywhere that it goes. The Bible says there is a river that flows through the city of God and it brings healing wherever it goes but it has to go so the word of God has to go into every part of you let the word of God touch your finances let it touch your prayer life let it touch your ability to desire souls saved let it move to every aspect of your life so that you might be steadfast immovable lacking nothing so as we break bread today I want you to take to heart these three things in particular that I have shared with you as practical applications together with the insight that you are a tree according to the image of your heavenly father. And for you to be fruitful and to have much fruition, you need to abide in him. You can't be out of step with him. You need to do what he does. Love like he loves. Pray like he prays. Because you know God prays. Because when Jesus was here, the Bible says he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily and he would pray. Because if God, if Jesus did not pray while he was here, then do you think it would be right of him to expect you to pray? Because people will say, but you, you didn't pray. I heard a man of God recently say this. He says, if Jesus, who was God in human form prayed, what about you? Who have no form at all on some days. Alrighty, so we're going to open the Bible one more time. Do we have time? Because I want us to take a scripture to break bread. Come with me to Romans chapter 3. And this scripture, we may unpack it just a little, but it's really for connecting with this item that is in our hands. How many people like the fact that we always have a scripture for breaking bread? Yep. Praise the Lord. Look at what it says. Revelation chapter 3. Did I say Romans? Okay, well, you can get to Revelations. It's okay. It's, it's, it's waiting for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant to say Revelations. The Bible says in Revelations chapter 3 verse 4, I'm okay, since I was the one who didn't give you the right one, I'll wait for you to get there. In 2023, I pray for you that the word of God will become your best friend. Amen. That you will not get enough of the word. That you will study the word of God all the time. That you will study the word as though your life depends on it. It doesn't matter whether you read it as a little child or not. It doesn't matter. What matters now is that you have awakened and you will study the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. I want you to, I'm going to give you some pointers so you can unpack this on your own. We're going to break bread with it because of the fact that it's a scripture that tells us about the blood of Jesus. And so as we're breaking bread today, I want you to think about this. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. It says, you have a few names. In case you were getting upset that I was calling you a tree, the Bible says you have a few names. Some days you're a tree, some day you're a vessel, some day you are just clay in the hand of God, some other days you're a lion, some other days you're a lamb, but you're never a goat. Let's tell Brother Kirk that, okay? You're never a goat, you're a sheep. He says you have many names and a goat is not one of them. So. But let's read what it says. It says you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. Sardis means the flesh. 
The literal meaning of the word sadis is the red ones. Red meaning this outer covering. Every human being that is on the face of the earth is a particular shade of red because the dirt from God's perspective is red. When he made man from the dust of the earth, he called him Adam. Adam means red. Okay? So the significance of sadis. And God is saying that even on that earth, where people are getting their feet dirty, they're getting their garments soiled, the flesh is staining their garment. We have a few people who have remained unstained. And the only way you can remain unstained in sadis is if you allow yourself to constantly deny the lie and embrace the truth. Denying the lie is making your garment repelling of filth. It's not that dirt will not come on you, but don't let it stick. In this life, dirt will always come on you. You will have a thought that is not pure before the Lord. You will get angry at somebody. You will find yourself in the company of some people that you thought were doing the right thing. And before you know it, wow, they just invited you to come and do evil. But guess what? Do not let the dirt of sadness remain on your garment. Let it repel it so that you can appear before the Almighty God always righteous don't let the devil stop you from going in the presence of your heavenly father because of what you have not done or because of what you have done let your ability to go in and out of the presence of god be a 104 percent a function of what jesus has done so that you can be in sardis and still have a white garment so today as we break bread jesus said as often as you have the opportunity do this in remembrance of me we need to keep ourselves in remembrance of the sacrifice that he made and the reason why he did it. He did it so that he who became sin would do so for you to become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, the Bible did not say you became righteous because if you become righteous, at some point you can also become unrighteous. But the Bible says you became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That means your nature in its entirety is the righteousness of God. So don't let the devil sell you otherwise. You are a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So as we break bread today, I want you to just be full of thanks. And just say, Jesus, I thank you for your finished work at Calvary. I thank you for becoming sin so that I can become the righteousness of our heavenly father. I thank you because even though I am in sadis, I am on this earth and in this facade, I am able to still stand before you and the heavenly father, righteousness. Stand as the righteousness of God because God is a good tree and I am one of his fruits and that makes me good. If you would recognize that your goodness is a function of God and not you, you will stop being offended at other people. Because nothing they do will mean much anymore because it's like, man, look at all of what I did and God still calls me friend. You see what I mean? Praise the Lord. So let us take of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you. Nothing qualifies anybody to take the body of Jesus. You don't have to be a priest. You don't have to be a saint. Nobody ever becomes a saint without the blood. So there is no prerequisite for taking the body of Jesus other than the fact that you recognize that you need him. The ones that were condemned for taking it unworthily took it as a means of pleasure and entertaining themselves. And the Bible says they have their damnation. But for the rest of us, we take it because we all need the body of Jesus. He says, if you don't eat of my body, you don't have a part in me. We all need the blood of Jesus. He said, if you don't drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no part in him. So we eat his flesh and we drink his blood that we may abide in him. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in Jesus' name. Oh, I was drinking my microphone. Praise the Lord. While we're still standing today, I'm just going to say a prayer. Thank you. Thank you, baby. All righty, God is good. Now I'm going to open the Bible one more time. You see? Oh, Rabaku skin tell that you get We're going to pray for like two, three minutes because I, I'm eager to share this with you, but I know that for me to share it with you, you have to pray. So 
Maybe we should take a po if you want to hear it and you will pray afterwards, let me see your hand. Now, people don't want to pray. They don't want to hear it. Okay, maybe I'll, well, I'll organize a special class. Now, what I want to share with you is something that has just been revealed to me. And I, I shared it with Alan and I told him, you have to pray. This is not one of those things you hear. It is confidential. Okay? It, when it was shared with me, it was wrapped in mystery. And I'm glad because for me, I was excited because there was a time in my life, if I saw a vision like this one, I would have run and I would have been afraid. I'm not going to label you with all the details of what I saw, but what I'm going to tell you for a fact is this, very quickly, I'm just going to tell you that it was shroud, it was wrapped in mysteries. And so here we are. Um, yes, very good. I'm glad I sent it to you because the first part of it, there's a word there that I needed to, to take. So I, I saw a vision, two of them, back to back, just this Monday or so. When did I send it to you? Was it Monday or Sunday? Sunday. The stars of the heavens, the Bible says, just before the Lord Jesus comes, the stars of the heavens will fall to the earth. As a tree, a fig tree, that gets shaken such that its figs fall to the earth. Now, the ones who have intended for us to miss our season have ensured that they, can, that they have tried to lie to us, or not, not even ensured, they have lied to us, and in an attempt, they did that in an attempt to make sure that we don't understand the signs of the heavens. Alrighty. If someone's about to make a delivery to your house, and I'm and I want to steal what they're about to deliver to your house. I can't just come and take it because you are there, you're home. So what I want to do is I want to mislead you so that you don't know the time of your delivery and then I can take it. Now, Jesus kept warning his disciples not to miss their season. He said, as soon as you see this and see that, look up because your redemption is drawing near. Why? Because only the ones who look up will be taken up, right? Jesus said it. Before he went to the cross in John chapter 3, verse 16, after I mean, in John chapter 3, I believe, verse 14, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever looks unto him will be saved. You can be aware of Jesus all day long, but if you don't look to him for sustenance, if you don't look to him in hope and in anticipation because he's the hope of the sinner, you will not receive what he is offering. You have to look up. And that's why they made the movie, Don't Look Up. Which is interesting. You know why I watched that movie? I saw the cast of the movie and I said, I recognize this person, I recognize this person. They're currently on a mission to promote these kinds of messages. So whenever I see that people, those people in any movie, I'm watching it because I know they're, they are currently in that groove. So I watched the movie, Don't Look Up, and I'm like, wow, this is the reason why we have to look up. Because if you don't look up, you will not go up. So you need to be mindful of the signs. And that is the reason why they told us that the stars are four light years away or four million light years away. When God said in the day that he made them, he put the stars, the sun, the moon, and the, and the stars in the firmament of the heavens, in this firmament that is under the blue sea that you look, that you see when you look up. Because when they start falling, they don't want you to know that it is one of the very last signs before Jesus appears in the blue skies. So I was taken up in the spirit and I was with this angel of the Lord who was in a ridiculous disguise. I have never seen an angel of the Lord disguised like that ever. I could have sworn that it wasn't an angel of God. But deep cause to deep. Let me give you an example. Imagine walking on the side of a busy street and you see a prostitute. And you're like, this is obviously a commercial sex worker. But then the fragrance of righteousness was coming from them to the extent wherein you're like, wait a minute, my eyes must be deceiving me because the vibes that I'm getting is not what I am seeing. That was the kind of disguise that this angel was in. And he said to me, come. And immediately I appeared as a government agent who has been given security clearance to go and perform certain functions. So he cloaked me also and I became one of them. I was in the company of people who were being instructed. In fact, some of them had gone out to the field and returned. And when I saw what was in their hand, it was the nucleus of a falling star. Because the Lord had revealed that to me prior. I had seen it prior. 
what it looks like. So as soon as I saw it, I was like, yes, this is the order of Sirius. This is the nucleus of a falling star. What is he doing here? But I kept it to myself. And then they told us that we needed to go and hunt it down for the people must not know that it has begun. And so they went out and they started collecting these stars. I tell you what, the stars of the heavens have started falling to the earth a couple of months ago. No, weeks ago, you saw that guy in California whose house got burnt because it was hit by what they call a meteor. They said there were meteor showers and all of that stuff. They will call it all kinds of things so that you do not know. But the Bible says, what is the meaning of a meteor? A meteor means a star. Oh yeah, the word meteor, the original word meteor is a star. But then they don't want to call it star so that you don't know prophecy is being fulfilled. But I've told you, please, I want you you would have to stay and pray some because that was the requirement that was given to me. The other thing that I saw is from that place, we went to another place. And again, I was groped in another form. So I came into this committee of people who look very elitist. And you know what they were talking about? They were talking about, they were reviewing different algorithms that were being presented to them for rationing food. They want to ration food because that is the last control. Because one of the ways by which you can control people is you control what they eat, you control what they drink. Do you think it's a coincidence that most of the food processing centers in the United States of America have just been catching fire of late? And the elite have been buying up farms and shutting them down, giving farmers too much money that they know what to do with? Remember when the price of crypto curse kept on going up and up and up? Yeah, that was when most of the farmers got paid because they were, their contracts were executed pretty much by the same firm. And so as soon as they were getting paid, they were buying crypto. The price of crypto was going up and the same elite crashed the crypto and took all the money back from them. Before they sold it, it was theirs. After it was sold, it was still theirs. They played us or them. So I didn't sell them no land. But here is the deal. These two things, one of them has begun, which is the stars of the heavens. And they're hiding it from us. But the other one is the rationing of the food. You don't have to worry about it. You know why? Because David says, I was young, but now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. The young lion, they suffer hunger. But those who put their trust in the Lord, the Bible says, will lack nothing good. You are not to worry, but you are supposed to pray. Because it's either you're praying or you're worrying. You have to do one of the two. There's no middle ground. I tell you with more privilege, with much privilege comes much responsibility. And so the privilege of not having to worry is the responsibility of having to pray. So we're going to pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus for eyes to be opened. Pray for the eyes of your neighbors to be opened. Pray for the eyes of your siblings to be opened. Pray for the eyes of your children to be opened. And even if you are still batting the eye, pray that your eyes will be steady upon the cross, steady upon the Lord, that you may see and know your season, that you may see and know the times that we're in, that you will not fall for the deception of the enemy, neither will you be taken by the lies of Satan, that you will recognize that we have come to the times that were prophesied of, even by the Lord Jesus himself, where the stars of the heavens are falling to the earth and that Lord even in the midst of all of these things our hope is being renewed our confidence is being strengthened while others are looking around and running around we will look up and we will be caught up in the mighty name of Jesus open my eyes oh God that I might behold wondrous things that I do not know let me know my season and let me know my time let me operate in the same spirit of knowledge as the sons of Issachar the Bible says and the children of Issachar were different from the other tribes because they knew the signs of the times by being able to read the stars and know their season. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we will not be lost. We will not be deceived. We will not be blind because whom the Son says free is free indeed. Jesus has set me free. I will know as I am known. I will see and not stumble in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, because our redemption is drawing nearer and nearer. Praise the Lord! and now we're going to pray I tell you what they can ration bread and of course you can think about all of the things that come with rationing bread um, with rationing bread is the potential for people to get so aggravated and to bring out 
all their anger, street riots, civil wars, disappearances. I mean, the disappearances have already started happening somewhat. But you know what? In the midst of all of that insecurity, in the midst of all of that takedown, the Bible says when they say there is a casting down, you will say there is a lifting up. We're going to, this prayer is very simple. This is what has been revealed to me. You're only going to pray for one thing. You pray for your tongue. Okay, let me say that again. Pray for what? Your tongue. Because everything that has to do with your belly must be managed by your tongue. Jesus' belly was hungry and Satan said, turn these stones into bread that you may feed your belly. But he says, no, I'm concerned about my tongue. He said, I need to focus on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So say that in this season, I will speak only life. In this season, I will speak the word. In this season, I will say there's a lifting up. In this season, when others are saying death, I will say life in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, it is my season to speak life. It is my season to speak praise. It is my season to speak your mind. It is my season for praise. And I shout for triumph in the season of praise. Lord, I shout for triumph in the season of hope. Lord, I shout for triumph in the season of peace. Lord, I shout for triumph in your name. I shout for triumph in your name. I shout for triumph in this season of praise. I shout for triumph in this season of hope. I will speak no guile, but I will forever confess that Jesus is Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. All righty, so do me a favor and do yourself a favor also. Do not keep these things to yourself. You need to share this with somebody. By the grace of God, we will have this out on Saturday, on Thursday, right? Share it with somebody. Let them know what is coming. When Daniel saw the coming of the Lord Jesus, as Michael came to open the clouds, you know one of the things that he saw, apart from the trumpet that was blowing, he said, I saw the ones who turned many to righteousness, they were getting transfigured. They were becoming light. And so you want to be one of those people who turn many to righteousness. So share this link with somebody when it is out and let them know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Praise the Lord. Alan, can you please come and receive the offering? And um, I have an announcement to make while you're getting ready. On the 20th, which is two Tuesdays from now. Yep, 14 plus 620. Yeah. In two Tuesdays from now, we're going to be having our Christmas party. Praise God. God is good. Oh, yes. Don't worry. By then, schools would have been on holiday. So we can be as late as we want and your children can sleep in. It's all good. All righty. Because you're wondering who does a Christmas party on Tuesday. Well, it is what it is. So we're going to do it on Tuesday. I just want to encourage you. We have quite a number of constraints. You know, we have uh, people like Bennett who may not even be available on, on the 24th. And um, even I may not be here on the 24th. Uh, and so we just thought, okay, you know what, well, why don't we do it when we are all still here, right? So on, the, on Tuesday, the 20th, we will eat as we typically do. Uh, but I want you to invite somebody along because we're going to be having some giveaways. One of the things that we want to do is we want to truly bring out all the generosity that is in us to give gifts to one another on the day. You understand what I mean? And so let's be ready. And please don't, uh, anyway, because when I said, I know some people don't like to hear that, giving gifts to one another because it's a sign of something else. But just come with the generosity to be a blessing to somebody. And let's keep it very uh, celebratory, okay? So that's on the 20th. Now, um, what else am I missing? That's it. Alrighty. So we'll give you more details, what else, whatever we want you to do on the day um, or, or ahead of the day, we will share with you. We'll get in touch later on. Um, if you're not a member of our face of our WhatsApp group, I encourage you to join our WhatsApp group. We're very decent people. We don't bother you too much. And if you think we are sending too many messages, you can just mute it. But at least whenever you're led, you can go there and you will see it. Alrighty, but I wouldn't recommend that you mute it for too long because some great things happen in that place that you want to catch 
in the moment. But join the WhatsApp group. Alan is here. He can enroll you in the WhatsApp group for free. There is no subscription. And then you, and yet you get all these amazing things. All right, God is good. The offering stuff is on the screen. Alan's going to come up in just a minute and take up the offering. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Not going to hold this here. We're going to go ahead and tap into worship with tithes and offering. You'll see the giving details there on the screen. We have the offering basket here if you need an envelope. Uh, if you would, Brother Kenyatta, if someone needs an envelope, if you just pass it to them. But I know most of us have gone digital, so we have the details there. What a message tonight. <clears throat> Come on, it was sweet. So good. Hallelujah. So as we prepare our offering, Let's give him worship. Let's give him thanks to the Almighty for we know that he's the one that gives seed to the sower. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we love you. We worship you, O oh God. We thank you for taking us by the hand this season. Lord, we know by your Holy Spirit that you help us, O oh God, that you counsel us in these times, O oh God, for we count it privileged to be your children here at the end of the age, O oh God. At the 11th hour, O oh God, you've called us to be here. And we thank you, O oh God, for the good work that you have begun in us that you indeed bring to completion. Lord, we thank you for every household represented here, O oh God, every seed, every um, um, method of giving, O oh God, that um, you have encouraged each one with, oh God, that these tithes, that these offerings be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bless it. Multiply it, oh God. Let these ones see your right hand strong in their life, oh God, for your name's sake. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All righty. Fellas, y'all know what time it is. We got men's breakfast this Saturday. Come on, somebody's excited. I know I am. It's been a little while. We know we had Thanksgiving uh, last month, so we're gonna get back on track this Saturday. All right, so I'm excited for that. And we look forward to seeing you Saturday evening, 6.30 for worship gathering. All righty, thank y'all so much for coming. Y'all be blessed.